Um, I'm going to be talking about providing care, behavioral care for treatable dogs and cats, specifically talking about it's easier and cheaper than you think. My background, um, as Lynn said, I work for both Pet Behavior Care and the Center for Shelter Dogs at the Animal Rescue League of Boston. What that means is I work for a shelter. There are actually three shelters that are part of our organization, so I work in a shelter with shelter dogs. I also see behavior appointments with private clients, which I feel has given me a very unique perspective in seeing the people who are trying to treat the problems and want to save their dog versus the dogs and cats that um, people have lost their bond with. I have a tendency to say dogs because, um, as you see by that logo, I do work for the Center for Shelter Dogs right now. So much of my focus within the shelter is dogs, but I do love cats. Um, I love to work with cats whenever I have a spare moment, and I definitely see behavior appointments for cats. So if you have questions about cats, please ask. Um, just like Dr. Peterson, I'm gonna be talking for a while. Please reserve your questions for the end, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Just to start with common cat and dog behavior problems that I see in our shelters and the shelters that I've worked with over the years. Things like fear, aggression, inappropriate elimination being a common one. And then dogs, simple lack of training is obviously a very common one and then other similar factors. I think it's very interesting to, t to think about all of this in relation to Dr. Peterson's lecture because I think there's advantages and disadvantages to working with behavior problems in a shelter. On the one hand, it can be very, very frustrating for me because I'll have a dog or a cat come in with a problem and I just keep thinking, gosh, if only this person had been a little more dedicated, I could have fixed this problem so easily. And so it's frustrating that the pet got relinquished. On the other side of the coin, we have an, a, an opportunity for a fresh start in that if I have a dog who has aggression toward children, I have the opportunity to attempt to place that dog in an environment where there's no children at the home and it's a home where people don't have plan to have children. So there's a lot that I can do in terms of selecting the perfect match for that particular dog or that particular cat that is then gonna make, help that pet to have a successful life in a new home. And I think that's where some of the paradox comes in between what Dr. Peterson was talking about in the survey versus reality is that we are in a situation where we do have the opportunity to start anew. And obviously it's challenging, but we do. So at the Animal Rescue League of Boston, we have a great team of people who all work together to manage our population. So I'm here talking about behavior. We also have a great shelter medicine team. Great, great, great shelter manager, Marin Gasparo and as well as dog trainers. As far as the behavior side of things goes, I work for the Center for Shelter Dogs where we're planning programs, but it's important for me to acknowledge that I am probably like a lot of you out there in that I have, you heard me talk about three different jobs, so I don't have a whole lot of time to actually devote to our shelter. We don't have a whole lot of volunteers. Um, we are working on building our volunteer program and we are making great strides towards doing that. We have some great volunteers, but we really, really rely on our volunteers in terms of the success of these programs because all of us have multiple things that we're doing as I'm sure all of you are. So um, I'm gonna be talking about a lot here. That sounds great, but we're all the same. And throughout this lecture when I'm talking about treating dogs and cats with behavior problems, it's really important to acknowledge that I'm talking about dogs and cats, that your particular shelter has the ability and capacity to safely treat, manage, and rehome. And what I mean when I say that, can you provide that pet with humane care and a good life while it's in the shelter? And can you safely rehome that pet? Do you have the resources to do it? As we'll talk about here, it's a lot of it is just time and training. It doesn't, it doesn't take a whole lot but making sure that if you're not a place, if you're just developing a behavior program and you're just starting on things, when you have a pet with more challenging pro problems, go to your community and see who else is out there and who might be better able to manage that particular pet. Key components of a shelter behavior program, behavior evaluation, getting a behavioral history on the pet. We have a questionnaire that we use at the Animal Rescue League of Boston 
I'm going to be showing a couple, um, several documents throughout this lecture. If you hear me talk about anything that you would like a um, copy of, my email address will be at the end. Please email me and ask for them. I'm happy to send them to you. Having shelter behavioral guidelines and plans, so just like we have medical protocols, having protocols and plans for behavior is very, very important. And then the very, very big side of things for us is adoption screening, behavior counseling, and follow-up, doing things to match that pet to a good home and make sure that it's successful. When I'm talking about behavior, I'm always, always thinking about managing the population in our shelter, so managing the group as a whole so that we have programs to maximize the welfare of dogs and cats in our shelter. But it's important within that that we don't forget about the individual dogs and cats and utilizing practices, which I'll be talking about, that increase the efficiency of our sheltering and our understanding of the individual animals. As I said already, volunteers, those um, are the heart of the program, and that's really how it gets easier and cheaper than we think is really using our, our volunteers, because our volunteers are amazing. Using free resources, we have some free resources from the Center for Shelter Dogs, but there's lots of free resources out there in terms of helping you to improve your behavior programs. And most importantly, a good behavior program does certainly require organization and plans, as I talked about but it doesn't require a lot of money. So gonna go through and talk about different aspects of our behavior programs at the Animal Rescue League and the Center for Shelter Dogs. First, by starting about our evaluation process because I think that's crucial in terms of understanding the individual animal. And we have developed the Match Up to Shelter Dog Rehoming Program, which is a program that uses all available information about the pet's behavior. So their behavioral history, any information about their behavior in a previous home, their behavior evaluation results, and behavior that's been observed in the shelter. So if we observe that the dog is jumping up on people in the shelter, that gets thought about in this program to help us guide treatment and placement decisions. So we're going to go through the different aspects of our evaluation process, starting with the behavior history. And we have about a four-page intake questionnaire. Many people ask, well, are people being honest on these questionnaires? And I actually did research on that during my specialty training program at UC Davis. And we found that for some categories of behavior, specifically owner-directed aggression and stranger fear, yes, people were less than likely to be honest. But what I found is the Animal Rescue League of Boston used to be an open admission shelter. We now call ourselves a flexible admission shelter. And, and what we mean by that is we have a waiting list for people to come into the shelter. And, but once they come into the shelter and we've, we've decided that they're adoptable, we will keep them for as long as it takes to find them a home. So we certainly have dogs that have been with us for nine months, cats that have been with us for a year. What, what I found is that as the Animal Rescue League changed from an open admission to a shelter that is known as a shelter that takes some of these pets with behavioral challenges, is that we're getting more honesty on these intake questionnaires. Because if the public perceives that we're going to do everything we can to help try to place the pet, it seems to me that they're more likely to be honest. Because people report, they certainly report problems on the questionnaires that we give to them. And I didn't get as much reporting of that when I worked at other shelters that didn't have the same policies. So our, our questionnaire is four pages long. Some people say, well, isn't that very long? Isn't that too long for them to fill out? For people who are dedicated to really wanting their pet to find a new home, they are very, very willing to fill it out. And we certainly, for people who have language barriers, things like that, we fill it out with them. Moving on to the behavior evaluation. <clears throat> our behavior evaluation is a standardized behavior evaluation that has 11 sud tests looking at standard things that um, are on many different behavior evaluations, such as interaction with people, response to handling, how the dog plays, is the dog possessive, how does it respond to strange and novel things, such as a life-size Barbie toddler doll and a strange-looking woman, and then we do a dog-dog interaction. We don't do a cat evaluation on our behavior evaluation. 
And the behavior evaluation itself identifies behavioral traits, which really help us to maximize the odds of a safe and successful adoption. So through the, the course of our behavior evaluation, the pet gains scores for aggression, fear, excitability, friendliness, playfulness, and trainability. So as an example, trainability, the maximum score you can get is 15. So if I am reading behavior evaluations results of a dog and I see that the dog got 12 out of 15, I know that that, that is a dog that did well on the training section of our evaluation. So it helps to create a, a common language so we can understand where that dog lies in relation to other dogs. And it also helps us to figure out where we should place this particular dog. And so that's the personality scoring in relation to the evaluation. <clears throat> As I said already, we also look at behavior in the shelter. So anything that happens in the shelter of concern gets recorded in our shelter software. We use Chameleon and incorporate it into the, this entire system. The, if something, if we've already done our behavior evaluation and then a week later the dog bites another dog. We have play groups at our shelter where all the dogs go out together and play with each other. And if a bite were to occur in that play group, then their, their summary, which we'll talk about next, gets changed a little bit and that their points get changed if a bite were to occur. So we're always reassessing and reevaluating. So the outcome, besides the personality scoring of the um, evaluation process, including intake evaluation and shelter behavior, is that the dog gets points. And I'm talking about dogs here and not cats. We provide general guidelines for what those points may mean to a shelter, but it's very important to acknowledge that every shelter is different. So for our shelter, and probably for most shelter, a dog with zero to three points is a dog with few or no problematic behaviors, likely to be a very easily adoptable dog. A dog with four to 20 points may have some problematic behavior, so a dog who had growled at other dogs is gonna fit into that category. And it may benefit from behavior modification. It, it may just benefit from pre-adoption behavior counseling. A dog with over 21 points is a dog that has several behavior problems or severe behavior problems. And this is the category above which we recommend seriously concern. Is this dog adoptable in your shelter versus not? These points are, as I said, guidelines which create a common language for us so that I know that if Jackie Boy got 32 points, and you'll see Jackie Boy later, I know what that means. Really, really important to acknowledge that we place many, many dogs with more than 21 points in homes. These are not strict cutoffs. We, it creates a common language, but we evaluate every dog as an individual when we're making decisions. Cat evaluations, as I said, I unfortunately work for the Center for Shelter Dogs and not the Center for Shelter Cats. But all cats in our shelter do receive a physical examination and behavioral observations. Not all cats receive a behavior evaluation because probably like many of you, our shelter is facing budget problems and we don't have enough staff and volunteers so that every cat can have a behavior evaluation. But we do do them on cats that may be going to foster homes, may need medical procedures or tests, or that have some very, very concerning behaviors that we're deciding whether to move on with that cat. So when we have questionable behavior or deciding whether we want to invest a lot of money into the cat, then we do do a behavior evaluation. And I'm just going to open up a document here that shows you an example of the behavior evaluation. <clears throat> Similar to the dog evaluation, we look at their behavior in the room, we look at sociability, we look at their response to being picked up um, across a number of different scenarios. We look at play behavior, and we score them for aggression, fear, friendliness, emotional arousal, and whether they recover from that. And I'm gonna show you that, and we have detailed definitions for our scoring. I feel it's very, very important that when we're evaluating behavior that we're very, very clear what mild, what moderate, and what severe means. So we have the cat get scored for every subtest on a scale of zero to three. Three is severe aggression where the cat bites. Zero means no aggression observed. So that's our cat evaluations. 
I'm also going to talk briefly about the Asilomar Accords because I do really strongly recommend using them in terms of creating a common language for your shelter and your community in terms of data keeping and in terms of knowing that your shelter has a general policy for whether a dog with severe food aggression is treatable, manageable, treatable, rehabilitatable, where it falls into things in your community. Always remembering that our problems are classified according to what a reasonable and caring pet owner would do and not according to the resources that I have within my shelter. So I may be absolutely overwhelmed with problem dogs in my shelter, which I often am because people try to send them to us, and I don't have the, the capacity to take one more problem animal right now. But um, I'm still going to classify that pet according to what a reasonable pet owner would do and not according to what I can do right now. Does that make sense to everybody? So just an example of using the Asilomar Accords to classify behavior in shelters. This is a matrix that I made up myself, not based on any research at all, just an example. I would consider a healthy pet a pet with no behavior problems at all. Treatable, rehabilitatable problems. Most behavior problems are going to fall into the treatable, manageable category because most behavior problems need some type of management to prevent them from recurring. So as an example, even in complete house training, if they don't manage it by taking that pet out as often as it needs to go outside, that pet's going to have a problem again. So most behavior problems require some management. Um, but I do have some, such as attention-seeking behaviors, that fall into the rehabilitatable category. And we do know that if our adopters are consistent about following our instructions, that the problem won't recur. And for me, with the unhealthy, untreatable category, I have um, lots of caveats there to what falls into unhealthy and untreatable. So you can see dogs aggression to dogs, cats, or people, which has resulted in severe injury to people and cannot be successfully managed despite skilled management and training. So as an example, if I have a dog in my shelter that has a history of fear aggression towards strangers, there is a decent chance that we are going to take that dog into the shelter, work with that dog, and see how he responds to management and treatment. We might even send him to a foster home, which I love to do, to see how he does there. If despite us doing everything that we can, this pet still has a very serious problem, and I feel that he's a serious risk to the potential new home and to the people who work in our shelter, that pet is then going to be moved into the unhealthy and untreatable category. So for me, oftentimes it doesn't fall into that unhealthy and untreatable category for behavior until I know that I've managed this pet appropriately and done everything I can to try to help it. Similar to what a reasonable pet owner would hopefully do. Daily rounds, so I talked about our evaluation process. I'm going to talk a little bit about daily rounds. We have a daily rounds for cats as well as dogs, where we have a team of people who walk through the shelter and at, evaluate every pet on a daily basis. The, um, I'm going to show you a document. So this is the daily rounds form that we use for dogs. We also have a daily rounds form for cats but it's a little different from this one. For our dogs, for the first three days in, our, in the shelter, we evaluate them for all the categories that you see up there. Appetite, where there's, there's urine or feces in the cage. The, um, we do our daily rounds at about 9.15, so after the dogs have been out to play group or for a walk if they don't go to play group. So ideally their cage should be clean and free of any elimination. Um, so that's answered as a yes or no in terms of whether that occurs. We offer the dog a treat. Does the dog eat a treat? If the dog doesn't eat a treat, so we have treat buckets outside our cage. I'll show a video of that later. If the dog doesn't eat a treat, we'll offer them a special treat, like a piece of hot dog or a super yummy treat to see if this dog is, is stressed because he's not eating. Would he eat something special? And then we score them, similar to the cat evaluation, on a zero to three scale for friendliness, fearfulness, aggression, jumping, barking, circling, and destructive behavior. So if there's no fear, you'll see that the space is left blank. 
if, there is, if the dog is hiding in the back of his cage and not coming forward, the dog would get a three on fear. And then we also have an other category. And then we also have a note section. So um, this dog was coughing a lot. So we had a note about that to um, let our veterinarian know. Um, obviously, I'm a veterinarian too, but I deal with the behavior side of things and our shelter medicine team deals with the medicine side of things. So we do, um, we record the observation for the first three days of a dog's stay. We used to record it every single day that the dog was with us. But what we found, and we haven't done the research yet to confirm this, but after the dog has been with us about three days, we're family to them. So initially we're the stranger walking by. They don't know us if they're a dog with fear issues. They oftentimes have problems with us. After three days of us walking by and tossing treats, they get to know us and they get very comfortable with us. So we found that after three days, we were getting, this is the friendliest dog in the world, no aggression, you know, it's a perfect dog. So we found that the most useful information was in the first three days. So we record the information for the first three days. After those first three days, we still do rounds and we still think about all those things as we're looking at the dog, but we don't record it unless the dog has a significant change. So if now all of a sudden the dog is behaving aggressively, I am gonna record it. Population management, I talked about managing the entire population versus the individual. For us, it's a manner, a way of maintaining a balance of easy versus more challenging pets. And when I say more challenging, I'm talking about pets that are more challenging to find an appropriate owner and home for, but these are pets that, once they're in the home, these should be pets that people love and are happy with and are not challenging for them. Um, because that is not our goal, to place very, very challenging pets into homes. As I said, we're known as the shelter that takes behavior problems, so we have shelters from all over um, our area asking us to take dogs with problems and cats with problems. And what we found is that we had a shelter full of dogs with problems and more cats with problems than were easy to find homes for. And what we were concerned about was going to happen over time is if every time a customer came into the shelter looking for a dog, we had challenging, challenging, challenging. We might be known to the public as the place that if you want a, a healthy dog for a family, you can't find one at the Animal Rescue League of Boston. So we have a commitment to maintain a balance of easier animals, so animals with less than three points, versus more challenging pets so that we can maintain that balance of easy versus more challenging. And, and also very, very important, probably for me, the number one reason I wanted to start this fast track program for us was that the behavioral cases for dogs take a lot of our resources. And if all, we only have 21 dog cages in our shelter, but if all 21 of those dogs had behavior problems, there's no way we, we can provide adequate welfare for them. So it's also acknowledging our capacity. We don't have the capacity to handle 21 behavior problems. So we've created a balance of easier so that it doesn't take as much of our resources. Daily rounds, very important for me because it may decrease length of stay. And that if I'm assessing and evaluating this dog or this cat on a daily basis and looking for changes, looking for reasons why has this cat not been moved up to adoption yet, um, the more attention I pay to that, um, we're going to have a decreased at-risk period because the quicker that cat or dog moves through the shelter, um, they're less at risk for getting diseases the quicker we get them out and we're gonna have an increased number of adoptions per time period. Remembering that decreased length of stay, so decreased length of time in the shelter does not mean increased euthanasia. And when the UC Davis team has been look, looking at this in terms of their data, they're certainly finding that that's not true at all. We're being more efficient, we're being better at what we do so that we move them through the shelter more quickly. Providing care, remembering that pets with problem behaviors often stay in the shelter for longer periods of time. So for me, providing behavioral care for treatable animals means that we always start our shelter behavior programs by creating appropriate enrichment and training programs for our shelter animals, and we'll talk about that next. But also by having creative marketing programs and outreach to find homes as well as regular reassessment. We've talked about our daily rounds, but we also 
on our dogs, repeat our behavior evaluation monthly. On cats, if we see that they've been with us for a while and they're not finding a home, we'll do an evaluation to see if we can find something that is making this cat a more challenging adoption. So as I said, start with the basics. We can save the most lives, we can do the most good in the easiest way by having a very good, strong foundation behavior and training program. So providing them with physical, social, and mental enrichment, so doggy play groups, um, feeding them through um, treat buckets, giving them Kongs, walking programs, things like that, through basic training, training dogs not to jump on us, not to pull on leash, and through behavior protocols. And we have written protocols for our treat buckets and Say Please program, which are on our website. I'm going to escape out of here for just a second and show you a video of us using our treat buckets. So what we do is we use our treat buckets with, treat how many of you here have treat buckets outside your, outside your kennels for dogs and use them? So great, we have treat buckets outside our kennels, as many of you probably do too, where we put dog food in. We actually put a mixture of adult dog food and puppy dog food in our treat buckets. And with a new dog to the shelter, as you're walking by the shelter, we just toss a treat to create positive associations with people. And as time goes on, we'll use them for training. So teaching the dog that they don't get the treat unless they have four feet on the floor. And we don't enter the cage unless they have four feet on the floor. So with um, finding care for providing care for these treatable animals, we do want to do everything, obviously, to minimize risk. And that's always a challenging issue to grapple with. We had the question earlier about how do you know what a dog will do. We don't know what a dog will do. We don't know what a cat will do. We can gain as much information as possible to attempt to predict, but I can't guarantee that my dog, my rat terrier Herbie at home, isn't going to bite me tomorrow. I think it's very unlikely because I have a long history of behavior with him where it hasn't happened before, but we can't guarantee anything with anything in life, but we can gain as much information as possible so that we're doing everything possible to reduce the risk. So obviously we want to attempt to place pets for adoption that are going to be safe in our community, and that really relies upon having a good programs where we are counseling adopters about, number one, making sure they're able to manage a pet with a problem, and number two, making sure as much as possible that it's going to be successful. So matching the pet to an appropriate adopter, that's oftentimes, we'll talk about this later, but that's oftentimes the number one thing that I think that we do in our shelter to save lives of these challenging pets, and that is finding that right owner, finding that person who to them, food aggression is not a problem at all. They're not worried about it. They, they're happy to have a pet with food aggression, and actually that's very common in our community. We want to be honest and realistic. We're always very honest with our adopters about what we've observed in, with the pets in our care. Always remembering that saving lives in our shelter involves our shelter, but it also involves, involves our community. I work in a community, Boston, which has a muzzle ordinance for pit bulls. So all pit bulls are required to wear muzzles in public. It's not a, a strictly enforced legislation, but it is there. And like many, many communities, we do have um, many, 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 many landlords who will not take pit bulls into their, their 
buildings. When I moved to Boston two and a half years ago with my pit bull, I'm a veterinary behaviorist. You think you'd trust me that if I'm moving with my pit bull that I'm a pretty responsible person. I had a really, really hard time finding a home with my pit bull. And so I, from firsthand experience, really, really understand when these people are surrendering their pets saying, I can't find a place to live with this dog. It's, it's reality in my community. So involving our community, working on breed-specific legislation, but also working if I live in a community where a dog that looks like this, and these are dogs that look like pit bulls, they're not necessarily pit bulls, but dogs that look like this are discriminated against, maybe I can send these dogs to a different community that doesn't have the same laws and they're more likely to be adopted. That's as we all know, that's always very challenging with dogs that have that physical appearance, but certainly something to always think about. Networking. Networking is a huge part of our program. You would think I'm a veterinary behaviorist. There's another veterinary behavior specialist who works with me, Dr. Amy Martyr. You think with all these specialists, we'd never have to send a pet somewhere else. That's simply not true. Um, we work and live in Boston. It's a very, very busy city, and it can be a very, very stressful place for some dogs. Some dogs are just completely overwhelmed by being in Boston, and they do horribly there. Or we have a dog with aggression towards other dogs, that seeing so many other dogs on a regular basis is very, very stressful to them and can be challenging to manage sometimes. So we have networks with shelters in different communities. We have networks, we have two other shelters ourselves, one out on the Cape, which is a lot quieter. We have networks with dog trainers in different areas and a couple dog trainers who also have adoption programs. So they'll take some of our more challenging dogs that for placement in the city and help us to place them. We also in Massachusetts have a program called the Pilot Program. Is there anybody here from Massachusetts? Oh, we have one person, hi. Um, we have a program called the Pilot Program where shelters in Massachusetts, if they have a dog that they're having trouble finding a home for, they can post this dog on a website and we have a whole network of people. So we very frequently get dogs transferred to us from the Pilot Program, so shelters in other communities that are having trouble placing a dog. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about treating specific, a specific problem. The treating aggression, there's always considerations we need to make before deciding to place an aggressive pet. So looking at the severity of the reaction, the dog or cat's potential to cause injury, how consistent is it? Um, Jackie Boy, who you'll see a video of shortly, has aggression over food and he was returned to our shelter because of that aggression over food. He was a chunky little guy, uh, Jack Russell. He is a chunky little guy still. And he, in the previous home, they wanted him to lose weight, but they also wanted to free feed their other dog. So when Jackie Boy went over to the other dog's food bowl, they would grab Jackie Boy, yell at him, throw him on his back, and do an alpha roll on him, and Jackie Boy bit them. Uh, I. I understand Jackie Boy. I, you know, that's a really, really challenging situation to put a dog in. And so we were able to look at the consistency of the reaction, the, the people's behavior towards that dog, and make a decision for Jackie Boy. Yes, Jackie Boy had bit, yes, Jackie Boy had bit the people in the previous home three times. But Jackie Boy now lives up in Maine with another dog and a wonderful family and has a wonderful life. So just a quick screenshot of the Center for Shelter Dogs website. If you go to the dog behavior section that you see underlined, you'll see a problems and management section, where right now we have management tools for two specific problems, food aggression, which I'm gonna be talking about now, as well as jumpy mouthy dogs, which walk you through the problem, give video examples, and make recommendation. As time goes on, we'll have more different types of problems on our website, so I do encourage you to revisit our website over time to see what more we have to help you out. Treating problems begins with very clear definitions. So we define a dog with food aggression as a dog who may behave aggressively when they are approached by a person when they are in possession of a food or food-related item. So that food-related item might be a rawhide, a pig's ear, a bone, a food wrapper, anything that is related to food, we consider that to be food aggression. 
We call a dog with mild food aggression a dog who shows teeth or growls when approached by a person or the fake hand when they have that. A dog with moderate food aggression is a dog who snaps and or lunges. A dog with severe food aggression is a dog who bites under these circumstances. So very clear definition so that if I say Jackie Boy has severe food aggression, everybody in our shelter knows what that means. The goals of our management and training programs at the Center for Shelter Dogs is number one, ensure the safety of people in the shelter and after adoption. First and foremost, that's always our primary goal. Number two, we want to teach the dog to respect and defer to people at all times via non-confrontational non exercises. So nothing in life is free, say please type program where the dog has to learn to sit for everything that it gets in life instead of being rolled on its back every time it does something wrong. Um, I'd say say please and nothing in life is free is one of the, the things that I have used in practice and with our shelter animals that has probably saved the most lives that and probably the gentle leader because I can't tell you how many of my behavior clients spend $400 to come see me and the thing that they're initially the most happy about is that gentle leader which allows them to control their dog so that it's not lunging so severely at other dogs out on walks. We also utilize training techniques that reduce the dog's possessiveness of items while maximizing that dog's behavioral health and welfare. So our behavior plan for a dog with food aggression, let me go to another link here so I can show you. So the dog will have a document that um, hangs on its clipboard where we keep track of everything that is going on with the dog. I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see a little better. that outlines everything that we're doing with the dog. So the first week, we work on our Say Please program. We avoid circumstances where aggression may occur. So if the dog is eating, we don't enter the cage. We feed meals in the presence of people once to twice daily, if we're feeding twice daily. We do that to desensitize the dog to our presence around that valuable item. So the dog learns that he can eat and we're not gonna mess with him, which is a very, very important thing for that dog to learn. And so, and we work on retrieving. I, um, with our food aggressive dogs, I think of a food aggressive dog as a dog who doesn't like to share. Not all people like to share, not all dogs like to share. And they want to keep all of their food. They don't want to share it for us, with us. Sometimes I don't blame them. So I begin by teaching them to share something that is not super, super, super valuable. So usually I start by teaching them to share toys. Retrieving exercises, if the dog doesn't retrieve, we play tug with him. And over time, we, so we do that the first week. The second week, we start working on a specific training plan for food aggression. And I'm going to escape out of here and give you an example. Here you will see Jackie Boy. And so this video is going to talk you through the basics and outline of a food aggression, our food aggression training plan. So with Jackie Boy, who has moderate to severe food aggression, we start working on something that he is less possessive over. So he was possessive of delicious chew toys like pig's ears as well as food. And so we start working with a delicious chew toy. Once we're successful with that, we start working with food. Initially, we're just teaching him to all he has to do, stop chewing, eat your treat, go back to your chew toy. Over time, he learns to leave the toy. We're not approaching him initially. We're not approaching him. We're not moving towards him at all. He's just learning. Pick up the treat. I get to chew on my toy again. Until he's willing to go far away. So the next thing we do is we start to pick up that delicious chew toy while Jackie Boy is moving towards the tree, which you'll see there. So now we're starting to handle it a little bit, but still trading. We're teaching him to share and to trade. And so after we, after we can toss that treat far away, then we start tossing it over time closer. So now he's not as far away from it as we're picking it up and we're moving around more as as he's, he's, we're doing these exercises. 
after many sessions, so this may take three sessions, it may take 30, but after many sessions, we can now lure his head away from the valuable item, pick up the, treat, the chew toy, and then he has to say please to get it back again. Our training sessions should always be fun, so we're always observing his body language. Not only do we want to make sure he's not aggressive, but we want him to have fun during these exercises. Lastly, or not lastly, but the last part you're going to see on this video is Lainey going right up to him, cueing him to sit, picking up the delicious chew toy, and then Jackie Boy gets it back again. We do reassess dogs with food aggression, um, repeating their behavioral evaluation over time. It's very, very common that our dogs with food aggression are still, still do behave aggressively on the behavior evaluation. Why is that true? Um, we're hoping to do research on that, but um, one thought is that some of these dogs are becoming sensitized to the fake hand and ses sensitized to the evaluation itself. And that, what I mean by that is that they learn that this test gets done and the scary hand comes at them and takes their food away and, and they can predict. I had this done before, it's gonna happen again. I'm gonna keep this, this thing away from this weird scary hand. Um, so we've had um, lots of dogs who still behaved aggressively on their evaluation, but um, like Jackie Boy still did, but did not behave aggressively during our training sessions. And Jackie Boy has been in his new home for um, several months now and is doing wonderfully. So this document, number one, if you were looking while I scrolled quickly, outlines the steps of the food bowl training plan. The, but it also offers the scoring system that we use to score on a daily basis the dog's behavior so we can be assessing response to our program. I'm gonna talk briefly about our special adoption program. So dogs who have significant fears, aggression over food, mild stranger aggression, mild to moderate stranger aggression, mild to moderate dog aggression, and some certainly some, we've had dogs that fall into the severe category as well. Separation anxiety, chronic house training problems, jumpy mouthy dogs. Many of dogs with these problems are dogs that fall into our special adoption programs, which I'm gonna talk about next. And as I said, I feel this is one of the most valuable things that we do in terms of successfully rehoming. And so initially, our special adoptions, they're flagged as special adoptions. Everyone in the shelter knows that they're special adoptions. The potential adopter meets the pet and is screened by our absolutely amazing adoption counselors through the normal adoption counselors. They do an amazing job. Usually when they give something to me as a special adoption saying, I think this is a good match, 99% of the time it is. Um, if they think it's suitable, they send a special adoption form to our behavior department. And the special adoption counselor, there's some shelter people who are special adoption counselor, counselors as well as some behavior department people who are counselors. We call that potential adopter. And if that adopter appears to be a suitable candidate, we schedule a behavior appointment that lasts about 30 minutes. During that phone call, we go over their, the form that they filled out that asks things like, what is your ideal pet? What is not acceptable in a pet? And 90% of people on the what is not acceptable say aggression and usually a couple other things besides that. And so I call them and I say, you want to adopt Jackie Boy. You said that aggression is not acceptable to you, but Jackie Boy does display aggressive behavior. We're always very clear, very honest, very forthright. Most people, when they write down that word aggression in our community, are saying they don't want a dog that they can't love and hug and handle, um, but a dog that they can manage easily by avoiding certain things they are more than happy to take. So we provide full disclosure. We send the client home with a document that writes out the dog's behavior in the shelter in its previous home and on evaluation that they sign acknowledging that they are aware of everything that's going on with the dog. And they also go home with instructions. As I was preparing this lecture, I had a question. That's a lot we put some of these people through in terms of having them 
get a pet into their home, and sometimes an aggressive pet into their home. So does it deter people? <clears throat> My experience is that the problem itself sometimes deters people. And for me, that's appropriate. I, if you're not someone who's comfortable with a dog with food aggression, I don't want you to take a dog with food aggression. So I think that's normal and appropriate. But most people really, really appreciate the level of care that we provide. And we very, very frequently get comments about how amazing our support is to them and how nice all the counseling they got was. Rarely they are deterred and they will find a pet elsewhere. That's something that we find acceptable in our book. We have a very, very, um, not a very, very, but we have a low return rate for our special adoptions as well as our regular adoptions. Less than 10% of our special adoptions are returned. So that's telling us that we're doing a pretty decent job. So examples of recommendations that we would make. Our focus is on safety and avoidance of the problem. So we don't allow the dog, for a food aggression example, access to bones and valuable items unless they're in a crate or kennel or we don't give them at all. We allow the dog to eat in peace. We don't disturb him while he's eating. And we never, ever, ever take something from their mouth. That last instruction is where we tend to have the most challenges and problems. People have a really, really hard time with the thought that you can't, if your dog has something, you shouldn't just open the dog's mouth and take it out. Um, so we very much focus on if the dog has something that you think is very valuable, valuable, your job is go to the kitchen, go to the fridge, grab a piece of chicken, take it out, and trade the dog for the chicken. We're very, very successful when we teach people about that recommendation. The best part, going home. This is a wonderful, wonderful man named Dennis Heafy. Um, Dennis Heafy has very limited use of his arms, no use of his legs, an amazingly inspirational man who I'm almost going to cry just thinking about him. He um, wanted a companion. He didn't want a service dog. He wanted a companion. And he had been to other shelters trying to find a companion. And people looked at him and said, you can't, how can you take care of a dog? And he can. He has aides who help him. And he's an amazingly resourceful dog. He's trained this dog to open up doors. He's trained this dog to do things to help him in many ways. He's an intelligent, resourceful man. And by us being flexible and recognizing that he's an individual, as well as Vinny, Vinny is a special adoption. He's a, a rat terrier looking dog who came from a hoarding situation with about 17 to 18 rat terriers. He was not handleable at first. I fostered him in my home for about six weeks before he came into the shelter and we worked with him there. And at the time he went home with Dennis, Vinny didn't love people touching him. And so Dennis was a perfect match for Vinny because Dennis can't touch him or can touch him only very in a very limited way. Um, Vinny has since become very, very friendly and they have found ways to interact with each other and they're very, very happy with each other. So bottom line, it's just being acceptable, being flexible, accepting dogs for who they are, accept, accepting people who they are, and making good decisions for them. Follow up for our special adoptions. We phone our adopter at one week, one month, two month, and three months, sooner than one week if we have any special concerns. And we have specific questions that we ask about how the dog is doing. And then in terms of follow up, we do offer a 50% discount on training classes through our shelter for any dog that's adopted. And for dogs and cats, we offer free behavior appointments for six months after adoption. So Vinny has, I mean, sorry, not Vinny, Dennis, the guy you saw in that picture, has utilized, we've probably seen him about six times to help him with basic training. And that is it. Thank you very much.